Welcome back. This video is a response to several comments I received about my previous video on using number 31 ferrite material for a high power ballon. I actively solicit comments and want the viewing community to understand these topics as well as possible, so a follow-up video seems appropriate. The comments were mostly about what effect, if any, does current have on ballon heating. It seems reasonable that current must affect ballon heating, and I felt the same way for years. Finally, I built some circuits over the years that cleared up the confusion for me. Let's look at an experiment that most everyone has the equipment to perform, and maybe some of you will do the experiment and let me know what you find. The experiment has two parts and looks like the drawing here. One I'm going to call normal, and one I'm going to call invert or inverted. And it consists of a 100 watt transmitter running at 7.1 megahertz. The frequency is not terribly critical or anything. And it consists of a common mode choke that is made by winding this heavy black line, which is a piece of, piece of coaxial cable, small coaxial cable, with, with a small number of turns. We are not trying to make this a really good common mode choke. We're just trying to get a certain amount of impedance. I'll explain that in a minute. And we're going to put a 50 ohm dummy load on the end of it. On the end of it, we're going to allow the dummy load to be connected either side of it, either the shield side back to the transmitter chassis, or in this case, the side of it where the center, the center conductor connects back to the chassis. So you need to be able to get access to both these points. Shown here is the setup I used to do the experiment. It consists of a 100 watt HF transceiver right here. The output of the transceiver has a short piece of RG8X 8 inches that goes to an SWR power and power meter that sits on top of the radio. On the output of that SWR power meter is this small diameter coax that comes down here. It's 14 inches long and it wraps with two turns through this core. This core is a ferrite core, number 31 material. It's 0.2 inch inside diameter, so I had to use small diameter coax. This is not RG316. It's a little bit smaller, but it's, it's still 50 ohm coax. It's rated at about 400 watts at 50 megahertz, so at 7 megahertz it runs ice cold. And there's a little 50 ohm resistor here that's mounted on a copper block. This resistor is good for 400 watts if the, heat, if the copper block can take it. And one side of it connects to, to the metal of the copper block. The metal of the copper block connects back here. And what I do is I unsolder these two connections, the center and the shield, and, swip, and swap them. And when I swap them, what I get is the, uh, the second circuit where it's an inverter instead of just a, the normal case. And if you don't have a resistor like this or anything, you can easily use something like a dummy load. The dummy load here has a T connector on the output of it. You bring the radio and the common mode choke connected here right into the dummy load and then you either connect the center pin here or the, the outside edge here back to the radio uh, chassis and you insulate the the dummy load. Your dummy load sits on a plastic block or something like that and it would, you would get the same results as I got. And in an attempt to make things even clearer, shown are two pictures. The first picture on the left here is a close-up of the 50 ohm resistor which connects to the chassis on this end and this end connects to the coaxial cable. The chassis is also the uh, copper on this, on this plate which is insulated from anything else by this plastic sheet here and a piece of, a piece of silicone here to keep this uh, copper if it gets hot enough from melting the plastic. The common mode choke is just to the left of the picture, and we see the shield connecting to the, ch to the um, chassis and the center conducting to the hot side of the resistor. The power meter ind indicated 100 watts and SWR of 1.00 to 1. There was no choking voltage across the common mode choke, indicating the fact we wouldn't need a common mode choke in this application at all, and everything was fine. This picture shows what I call the inverting mode, where these two leads were swapped. The center conductor now comes in and goes to the chassis connection. The shield goes to the hot side of the resistor and the common mode choke voltage is 68 volts now at 100 watts again from the radio, SWR of now 1.07 to 1. The SWR of 1.0 to 7 to 1 is due to the fact that there is some common mode current that flows and that disrupts things a little bit. But let's look at that in SimSmith a little more closely. I wanted this experiment to run with a 100 watt transmitter in the HF range, and I wanted to have a choking impedance that was bad enough so that the choke would dissipate power, but not so bad that the SWR the transmitter would see would be bad enough that it would reduce its power. So I came to, up to the conclusion I needed something in the order of two to three to four to 500 ohms, and two turns through the core that I chose, this 
ferrite core right here gave me pretty much what I wanted. So I measured those on a VNA, and this is the result. The overall impedance is shown in blue, the real part is shown in pink, and the imaginary part is shown in red. It's inductive over the whole range, but the resistive piece dominates pretty much over the whole range, uh, from frequencies above about 2.7 megahertz. And it does exactly what I was looking for. So this is the choke I chose to use for the experiment. Now that I had a common mode choke designed for about the impedance I thought I needed, I analyzed it in SimSmith using the same SimSmith file I used in the previous video. And this is the file that I made available for download. And it consisted of a circuit that had coupled transformers, and it consisted also of this circuit, which uses a transmission line with impedances across both sides of it. And both of these give almost exactly the same, the same answer. Let's look at circuit B for a moment because it's a little bit easier to understand from a circuit point of view. I believe the circuit A is a little more accurate, but they're so close together, it's, it, the results are it's not worth worrying about. So I have a two turns here. So my length of my transmission line is about 0.3 feet. It's 50 ohm transmission line. It's, its velocity factor is Teflon. And I put twice the file impedance from the VNA in there because these two are in parallel. And I have a load. The load is designed to be a constant impedance. R1 and R2 is a constant impedance. The fraction of that impedance is determined by the parameter BAL for balance. And if, B, and if balance goes to 1, it's like moving the ground point here up to the top. If the balance goes to 0, it's moving it to the bottom. If the balance is 0.5, it's in the middle. All the, all the while with the sum of these two resistances adding up to 50 ohms. So 50 ohms is the, is the load impedance, and the balance, the balance is 1 here, so my dots on my plot are over here at 1. If I move, it to, if I move this to 0, they move down here, and if I move, these to, move it to 0.5, they're in the center. What I'm plotting is a couple of things, and let's, pl let's plot for for circuit B because that's the circuit we we said we're going to use. So the first thing I notice, and that is, let's make this B0. Being 0 means the ground point is down at the bottom here. So this is effectively, has we don't really don't need a bell in here. We have ground on this side, we have ground on this side, a piece of transmission line to get from the transmitter to the load. And if we do that, we'll see the current So the blue, and the, the blue and the pink trace are the current through R1 and R2, and that's the differential current. They're, equal, they're out of phase, they're equally amplitude. They're out of phase because the phase dots are, are like they were in the previous video. And the amplitude is identical. The common mode current is virtually zero. If we zoom in here enough, we see that the common mode current is 2 milliamps when the differential current has a peak of 2 amps. So the common mode current is effectively zero, and we see the current is 2 amps peak. Now when we fully unbalance this circuit, which is what the second circuit in the experiment was when I grounded the other side of the 50 ohm load, that represents the case where this parameter goes to 1. And we see a slight skewing of the differential current. We see the peak current here being 2.09, and we see this current being 1.91, so it's about 5% higher and 5% lower due to the fact that the common mode impedance here is not high enough. Now, that is a little bit of a change, but that's not much difference in, cur in current um, through, this, through this choke. A person would be hard pressed to say that you could make some measure measurements that would tell much of this difference. The common mode current now is 1 tenth, 0.2, it's 1 tenth of the peak amplitude of the, of, the, of, the, of the average of these two um, differential currents. And now we have a perfect experiment. So what we have is we have pretty much constant current going through here, constant differential current going through here, but we do have a difference in common mode current. So let's see if we, what, we, what that results in in terms of the calculations. So what we'll do is we'll plot, I shouldn't have gotten rid of that, we're going to plot the power in these two resistors, R4 and R5. And that's done right here, the choke power. 
And what we see is the choke power running from zero up to about eight watts. And we can also plot the load power, which won't show on this, on this display because it's higher. It starts at a it starts at 100 watts and it, and it goes down to about 90, 92 when this goes to 8. So the 92 plus the 8 gives us 100 watts. So the transmitter is still putting out 100 watts. 92 of it's making, the lo making it to the load and 8 is making it to the, is being consumed in the uh, common mode choke here. And if we, let's make this, let's go back down to where we have, have a little more resolution again. We don't need to look at the other, the, the load. And let's look at the common mode voltage. So when the ground point is down here, the common mode voltage is zero. When the ground point is at the top of the, right here, com the voltage across the common mode choke is 68 volts. And that is the only thing that varies a lot. The, the differential current doesn't vary enough to make any difference in my opinion at all, but this varies massively. And the results are pretty, pretty amazing, to say the least. Before we get to the results, let's, let's look at the other circuit just for a moment. The other circuit gives us almost exactly the same results. But if we look very, very closely and we look at the common mode voltage here, we see a little, I, I just turned that on. If we, down at the very bottom, we see a slight difference in the common mode voltage. If we were to look at SWR, um, at point A in, in ground, or at point A in the generator, we see two traces, and we see that if we zoom in a lot here, we see that just, they're just a teeny bit different, and they're a little bit different at the low end. At the low end, they're different because this circuit has inductances that are not large enough. At the high end, I don't know what the difference is, but it's incredibly tiny, so it, it's really not worth worrying about. But we predict 8 watts roughly through the, um, 8 watts, we predict 8 watts being dissipated in this little choke. And as we saw with the big choke the last in the last video, 8 watts heated it up. So we sus I suspect this little choke ought to be pretty much boiling hot in a short period of time when we have the case where we ground the top. And when we ground the bottom, I suspect it's going to be cold. Remembering that the differential currents are almost identical. So, let's look at the results. The first test I did was with no ballon in the circuit at all. I wired the small diameter coax directly to the resistor with the polarity of the wiring being normal, where the shield of the coax matched the chassis connection on the dummy load. And I put 100 watts in the transmitter for five minutes, continuous power, and the temperature rise of the transmission line, the small coax, was less than five degrees Celsius. It was very hard to make this measurement accurately because it's such a small diameter coax, but it was, I could not tell it. I put the coax up against my cheek. I couldn't feel it. I put it against the back of my hand. I put a small thermocouple on it. It measured four or five degrees, and that's about as good as I could measure. Then I took the same circuit. I disconnected the coax. I wound it two turns through the core, and I put... The same power again, 100 watts for five minutes. The SWR here was 1.0 to 1. The SWR here was 1.0 to 1. Same differential current in the coax, both cases. In this case, the core temperature was less than a five degree temperature rise. In this case, the core temperature did not rise due to core temperature rise internally, but rose a little teeny bit due to proximity with the, with the wire being inside it and wound around it. And again, this was very hard to measure too. Temperature rise that small was very difficult to measure accurately. But I saw really no, no effective core temperature rise at all. Then I disconnected this coax again, inverted the two leads, so now we had the inverted polarity, and I put the power to it again. Within one minute, the core temperature, ro temperature rose over 100 degrees Celsius, uh, Dropping water on it, it boiled the water instantly. It didn't didn't just evaporate it. The water like you know sp splatted and in, uh, instantly boiled, indicating the temperature was probably more in the 120 degree range. And as we saw before, the differential current between this case and this case, this case had both peak amp peak amplitude of the differential current of plus two amps on both sides, and this one had it of 
2 amp, 2.05 amps and 1.95 amps, which is hardly any different, yet we saw spectacular temperature differences. The spectacular temperature differences are solely due to the voltage across the core due to common mode voltage. And I don't know what else I can say. This to me was was like the smoking gun that proved it beyond all, you know, all cases because I had kept the differential current to be almost identical. I could have perhaps made the differential current be even a little bit better by taking the power on this in this test and dropping it down to say 92 watts, which is what I get into the load here. But the difference between 92 and 100 watts is not going to change the temperature rise from 5 degrees to over 100, 100 degrees. So I don't think that's necessary. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. And if you do, let me know. And if you want to do the test, do and please let me know what the results were. Again, uh, if there's any questions, please let me know. Thank you again.